All right, so what do PC strategy games and the NFL have in common? I'm sure you could find more if you looked into it more than I did, but what I'm talking about is the disassociation of the name behind the flagship video game series. For the NFL, you probably know what I mean. Pretty much every major sport gets its own video game series with yearly releases, but so far to my knowledge, the NFL's is the only one to not just use the name of the sport or the league. Basketball has the NBA 2K series, baseball has MLB The Show, and some others. Soccer has FIFA and... Pests? Are they still making those? Golf had a PGA Tour, and then Tiger Woods' PGA Tour, and then Rory McIlroy's uh, PGA Tour, and then nothing because they haven't made a game in four years. Football is by far the biggest sport in America, and much to my dismay is home to the most valuable sports team in the world. No, the most valuable sports team in the world isn't Real Madrid or the New York Yankees or even the Pittsburgh Pond Grabbers. No, the most valuable team in the world is the bane of my existence. The Dallas Cowboys. Ugh. Anyway, so the point I was trying to make is that the NFL is the biggest league in the world, and the Madden NFL franchise is one of the best-selling game series in the world. But that's the thing. The newest game wasn't called NFL 20 or NFL 2K20. It was called Madden NFL 20. So who exactly was John Madden, and why is his name synonymous with the whole fucking series? He doesn't even look like an athlete! Well, it started when EA approached John Madden and he agreed to lend his likeness and expertise to the game. He actually considered it to be a teaching tool with the potential to test plays through it, so thusly insisted that the game be as realistic as possible. The first Madden game was released in 1988 for Miss, I want to say MS because it looks like MS, but I've heard it called Miss DOS. But it wasn't until seven games later, if you count the TurboGrafx-16 release, with Madden NFL 94 that they got NFL licensing rights, allowing them to use team names. And two games after that, if you count the 3DO release, with Madden NFL 95 that they got the NFL Players Association license, which is apparently a different thing, allowing them to use player names. And seven games after that, with Madden NFL 2001, before they decided to prominently feature a player instead of Mr. Madden himself. None of which is really relevant, but I thought it was interesting. Anyway, so you get the idea. Madden NFL games have been yearly releases since the first one. EA was the first to decide to use Madden's likeness to sell games, and they've been doing it ever since. It's been such an iconic pairing that I'm sure many people don't know Madden outside of his name in the title. And he was apparently a big deal in the world of football, becoming the youngest head coach in his time at 32. So anyway, believe it or not, I don't even really watch football. I just thought it was interesting how Madden's name has become synonymous with the game series it's been plastered on for fucking decades. I suppose that was bound to happen. I mean, it's so iconic that the NFL part of Madden's NFL games feels superfluous. It doesn't even really feel like a name anymore. Madden is just the word that the NFL games go by. Speaking of names being plastered on video games for decades, Sid Meier. You like, like how I... You like how I brought that around? Yeah, sorry, I wanted to make a quick introduction comparing Madden's name and the title of his games with Sid Meier's, but I kind of got distracted and ended up researching more into a football video game franchise than I anticipated. So if you're like me, you only really know Sid Meier's name because it's plastered on the front of all of the Civilization games. So just who is Sid Meier anyway, and why is his name on the front of all of these games? Well, that question alone is probably showing my age, because Sid Meier was a big dog back in the days of early home computers, and he's been referred to as one of the most influential strategy game designers of all time. But, if you're like me, you didn't know that. I mean, you probably assumed he was an important game designer. I mean, he'd have to be with his name in the titles of all of these games. But you don't actually know where he fits in with everything. Well, to give you a brief history lesson, Meyer and a buddy founded Microprose in 1982, where they made some 2D action games before settling into a pattern of flight simulators. In 1987, they changed form and released a pirate game, and this is cited as the reason for Sid Meier's name in the title. I mean, it was 30 years ago, so those involved remember the details a little bit differently. According to Sid himself, it was Microprose co-founder Bill Steely who suggested putting his name in the title since this pirate game was such a rapid departure from the flight simulators they had become known for. Maybe they could get fans of the flight simulators to recognize Sid's name and try out this new project. Now, according to Steely, however, they were at a Software Publishers Association meeting, sounds fun, and Robin Williams was there, oh shit, now it does sound fun, who turned to Steely and told him that they should put Sid's name on the box and promote him as the star. So yes, there is a chance that Robin Williams, the late great actor and comedian, is the reason we see Sid Meier's name on all these games, even all these years later.
Anyway, so it was 1987's Sid Meier's Pirates that first used Meier's name. Microprose would continue to release more games, some with Meier's name, some without. It wasn't until Meier left Microprose to co-found Firaxis Games that you really start to see his name popping up in a bunch of unrelated video game titles. Related in that they were developed by Firaxis, but unrelated in terms of the game's premise. There were pirate games and golf simulation games and Civil War tactician games. This guy's name was just on everything. And that's what I wanted to talk about today. About five years ago now, there was a Sid Meier Humble Bundle that I managed to get my hands on, and the games I got with them have been sitting in my Steam library virtually untouched since 2014. Now, I only have a couple of them, but I thought I'd go through and give these games a fair shot to see what some of the earlier Sid Meier games outside of Civilization are actually like, for those uncultured, like me, who really only know Sid Meier through the Civilization games. So let's start where it all began, sort of. Full disclosure, I played each of these games for only about an hour and a half. Two of them even less, one even more, so don't consider these a full review, but rather a humorous first impressions video. I'm definitely leaving a lot out, and I want to acknowledge that. Now with that being said, Sid Meier's Pirates is a remake of Sid Meier's Pirates. It helped to include the year in those descriptions. The 2004 Pirates I'm playing is a remake of the 1987 one, the original game to include Sid Meier's name. I looked up some footage of the old game and... Man, it looks like an old game. So this was a whole 17 years between the original game and the remake, and we're putting a 2 at the beginning of our years now instead of a 1. It's the 21st century, motherfucker, so let's see if Sid Meier's Pirates is worth a goddamn. But just in a second, though, because there is a severe lack of Wikipedia description reading here. Now it says there have been new features added, like an improved turn-based land combat system, but more importantly, a ballroom dancing mini game, so I know what I'm playing for. Now as you can see, I have played this game a little bit throughout those five years, but always gave up both out of boredom and because I have the attention span of a slice of ham, so this is my first time seriously sitting down with the intent of actually progressing onward, so let's set sail these seven seas, matey. And you know, see if the game is good or bad or something, I don't, I don't fucking know. So the game starts with this cheesy yet endearing studio logo that we've come to expect for this era of games. Game studios today don't really do this kind of quirky logo intro anymore. Anyway, you're thrown into a menu screen, and I think my PC just might be powerful enough to run this game at the highest settings, so I'd do that. And also, before I've even set foot in a ship, you can change your sail and flags, and I don't know what the differences between any of these are or how they might affect the game, so I just went for the Jolly Roger. I mean, I am a pirate, right? That's the pirate flag. So once you actually begin a single player game, it begins with a pre-rendered cutscene with a graphic style that only mid-2000s PC games seem to be able to achieve. So this family was indebted to this guy, but now their prosperity is soon to be restored, somehow. So their fleet is set to arrive the next day, carrying their hopes and salvation, but the guy they owe money to barges in and tells them that the fleet has been lost and then takes them all captive, except for one little kid who escapes. You then flash forward a mere 10 years later, and the kid who escaped, which is you, by the way, that ki that kid's your that you're him. You that kid's you. That you you play as him. That's you. Well, he seeks passage for the new world, so you pick a country to set sail with, and then off you go. But it's a pretty shitty trip, so you, along with everybody else, mutinies, and you somehow climb to the top of this mast in the commotion, and you win. So now you're the captain of this new ship and free to set sail in the Caribbean and do whatever your pirate heart desires. But ultimately, your main goal is to try and rescue your family. So once you get past the little movie, the game recommends playing with the keypad to sell your ship. Unless, of course, you're playing on a laptop computer. So this is the game that was made for lefties, because if you are right-handed like myself, you either have to awkwardly reach your left hand over to the keypad, or use the mouse in your left hand and then use the keypad with your right. You can just sail to where you want to by clicking there instead, and you can also click on the icons at the bottom right instead of using the keypad, which is what I did, so I didn't even use any of the weird keypad hotkeys. So if you're like me, you first start by just kind of clicking around in the menus to see what your limits and goals and options are. The game doesn't really tell you, kind of makes you feel like a pirate, except instead of exploring the seven seas, you're exploring the menus of this pirate game to see what exactly you're supposed to fucking do, because the game doesn't really tell you. So going through the menus, you have a status for your fleet and then your personal status where you can see the different quests and objectives throughout the game. Right now none of this makes any sense to you, but as you keep playing you gradually start to fulfill some of these and you realize what they're actually about. There's a world map that's pretty serviceable, shows you where you are, and I like how it shows you when and where eventful stuff that occurred to you took place. 
The game shows its age in minor ways, like by only letting you move the map by clicking the arrows on the side instead of clicking and dragging it like you might come to expect, but overall, pretty good. Then they have a list of the top 10 pirates in the game, and even though you've only taken command of one ship through a mutiny, you're already in the top 10. It's kind of cool to see what all the other pirates are up to and how much gold they've plundered and how many ships they've sacked compared to you, and I could imagine it being a driving force as you progress further through the game watching your character work their way up the ladder. Then you got the Pirateopedia, an encyclopedia that seems to explain every word in the English language. I mean, look at how dense this thing is. It's pretty cool though, I could almost see it used as a teaching tool. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if like every word pertinent to this golden age of piracy was in here somewhere. There's also a captain's log that just keeps track of every little thing that's happening, and a screen that shows the status of your ship's supplies. Now, so just to get this on the record, throughout this review, even though I'm the one playing this game, I'll refer to the player as you, to put you in the player's shoes to try and show you what you might experience while playing this game. This might not be fair, however, as you might actually be a much better and smarter player than I am, and I might be selling the experience short by insinuating that you would experience it in the same way that I would. And I say this because you spend the first 20 minutes of this game without a fucking clue as to what you're supposed to do. So once you finish watching the movies, the game just drops you in the ocean on your ship, so naturally the first thing I did was explore the aforementioned menu, but once you finish looking through those, what do you actually do in this game? That's what I was trying to figure out, so I didn't have a fucking clue, and the game doesn't really give you an immediate objective, so I just kind of fucked about, trying to figure out what I even could do, let alone what I should be doing. So the first thing I did was something you'll be doing a lot in this game, visiting various trading posts and towns and villages. Some of the smaller villages and settlements you meet will look a little bit different, but for all the major towns and trading posts, the screen and your options will look exactly the same. So I go and talk to the governor of this trading post, which is Dutch by the way, and right away I'm given a letter of mark to attack and plunder their enemy Spanish ships. Later on, I talked to the governor of a Spanish trading post who was eager to give me his own letter of mark to allow me to attack and plunder Dutch ships. As you progress through the game, the various governors will show their appreciation when you do shit for them by promoting you to higher ranks or offering you their daughters to take to the Grand Balls, so this game should really be called Sid Meier's Privateers because you're not really playing a lawless pirate who attacks ships in his own self-interest, but rather as a regal member of the various countries' navy. Well anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself, so at the various trading posts and shit, aside from talking to the mayor or governor or whatever, you can also visit the tavern. Now I know this game is old and has game design that's a little outdated, and in a way that's all part of the charm, but let me tell you, they got real lazy with the taverns here, because they all look the exact fucking same. Every tavern has the exact same layout first, but they also have these same people standing in the same places. You always have a barmaid standing by the bar who will whisper rumors to you. Then you got the bartender who will tell you random shit as well. Then you have a group of guys willing to join your crew if you want them. And then you got this fucker in the back who will either whisper a secret to you or offer to sell you various random shit like a treasure map or a ring or a new shirt. The only thing that did seem to change in each of the taverns was the music, which seemed to fit the culture of whatever country the trading post was supposed to be part of. And I must admit, I like what they did with the music and the overall look of the game. I just love the golden age of piracy in general, the look and sound, and this game is pretty charming with its take on it. If you're into pirates, you should definitely watch Black Sails on Stars. I know, I know, who the fuck has a subscription to Stars? Well, I recommend at least getting the free trial so you can watch some of Black Sails because it's one of the best looking shows I've ever seen, and it captures the pirate atmosphere perfectly. Anyway, at the various trading posts or cities or whatever, you can also trade with the merchant to buy more food and shit if you need it, and then you can also sell various cargo you plunder from enemy ships. You can also buy cargo from one trading post and sell it to another at a profit if that's what you're into, and then you can consult with the shipwright to fix any damage your ships might have. You can also divide the plunder, which I will get to, and then you can check the status of your crew and ship to see if all is well. So let's talk about ships. So you're going to be sailing around and seeing other ships doing various ship things and you're free to go up to any of them and start giving them shit for being in your fucking water. This is pirate territory, motherfucker! Ugh! I beat the ship and took my plunder. You can choose to keep any of the ships you defeat and they just kind of follow you around and it can actually become a bit of a clusterfuck. Like here. What the fuck? Just get out of- just get out of my- move! God damn it! So I actually managed to escape that tornado tangle of ships and arrived at like a native village and they asked me, some rando off the sea, which European colonial city they should attack, and I'm like, 
I don't fucking know, dude. And then I got to another city and decided to find out what dividing the plunder did. So when you do this, you get told that the crew is sitting with great anticipation for their share of the gold. And as the captain, you'll get to keep a larger share of the gold and your ship. Now, maybe I'm just really stupid and this little blurb gets the point across brilliantly, but I would have preferred for it to say, also nearly all of your crew and all of your other ships will leave and you will sit here for a few months before starting over fresh because I had no idea that any of that shit would happen. But now that I did, dividing the plunder seems like the way you can kind of reset yourself if you go about capturing a ton of ships and plunder. So yeah, at this point in my playthrough I was still just kind of sailing around aimlessly. I found out that when you're in a ship battle, if you just ram into the other ship before they're too weak for the ramming to defeat them, you can just go to ship hand-to-hand -hand combat and holy shit, this is way too easy. The game literally tells you what defensive action to take next, so you just parry or jump or duck whenever the game tells you and you cannot seem to lose. Even when I attacked renowned pirate Bartholomew Roberts, whose ship was huge and who had 30 more crew than me, I just rammed his ship and fought him and won. Even when I fought a Spanish war galleon that had twice as many guns and outnumbered my crew 16 to 3, and even as I saw my remaining pirate crew get diminished down to literally one guy, I still won the hand to hand combat and just took complete control of the ship. Now granted, I did find out later on that even when the game tells you what defensive option to take, you'll still actually have to time it appropriately, so maybe there is more depth to be found here, but in the hour and a half straight that I played, I never lost a ship battle, mostly by just going to hand-to-hand -to -hand combat and winning that. So the reason I fought that dude anyway, who outnumbered me 16 to 3, was because I found myself at a Jesuit mission talking to the abbot who told me that Baron Raimondo has information regarding my lost sister. Remember that from the beginning of the game? That evil dude captured your family and you're trying to get them back. I went to some other town and talked to the bartender who told me the last place he heard the evil dude was holed up at. So defeating guys like him are part of the game's objectives. I'm not sure what the game's actual win state is, but as you play the game, the previously nonsensical personal status screen starts to make sense and you can see what your goals are and you find out how to achieve them. As you work towards them, you get fame points. I never did find out what these points actually did, but they seem to be your main numerical mark of achievement. So before I wrap this portion of the video up, because there are three other games I want to talk about, I wanted to talk about two more of these goals that I managed to work on during my playtime of this game. The first is the treasure you can find. At the very beginning of my playthrough, I bought a treasure map from that shady dude who sits at the back of the tavern. At first, I couldn't make heads or tails over what the fuck any of this was supposed to be or how to read this map, but as I continued playing, I gained me sea legs and was able to make out just how to find this treasure. I mean, the most important part is right here on the bottom. You just have to find and sail to Puerto Cabello. So I did that, and you can actually leave your ship and walk around on land. And one thing this remake evidently improved over the original was land turn-based combat, but I never got around to trying that out. But yeah, you just go southeast of Puerto Cabello, like the map says, and you just kind of make your way through the landmarks and position where the treasure is based off of them. There's the first Inca temple, so you keep going. There's the Inca totem, and there's where the geysers are. So you just kind of work your way through, and boom, I was able to dig up the treasure. It was a pretty rewarding moment, and I had fun referencing the map to discern where the landmarks around me are and using that to find the buried treasure. The other goal I wanted to talk about is the romances. As you gain favor with the governors, like any true swashbuckling pirate, they'll offer you their daughters to take to the evening ball. Now even though this Dutch governor's daughter was apparently rather plain looking, I knew I just had to say yes to this because I knew I had to experience one of the mechanics that was added just for this game's remake, the ballroom dancing. It's all right. It's basically the same as the ship combat. You just press the right button, ideally in time. I thought I did pretty damn good at it, but apparently, I mean, she didn't look too pleased with me. She evidently liked me enough though to inform me of a reward for some guy. And that's Sid Meier's Pirates, or, you know, at least my first hour and a half with it. You defeat pirates, find treasure, locate your lost relatives, find lost cities, apparently, romance the royalty's daughter, and avenge some villains. It's all you could ask for in a pirate game. I didn't want to force myself to get too invested in this game because I'm already playing way too many at the moment, but by the time I ended my session, I found myself having fun with it. It took a while for me to get into what I consider to be the rhythm of the game, but once I did, I could see it continuing to be an enjoyable and rewarding experience. 
The game does suffer from being a little too directionless once you start, and it's the main reason why I never progressed any further during my short playthroughs previously, but in a way, I could also see that as a mechanic of the game. Like a pirate, you have to explore your options and limits and goals, and it does become rewarding once you figure out what you're actually doing. Aside from some little inconveniences that are to be expected from a PC game from around this time, and how easy it appeared to be, at least at the beginning for me, I give Sid Meier's Pirates a thumbs up. There aren't enough pirate games out there, and for my money, this was a pretty good one. Alright, so now we're going to move away from the archaic form of transport across water to the more industrialized and gentlemanly form of transport across land with Sid Meier's Railroads. So this game is actually the fourth in a series if you don't count the updated re-release of the first game. Microprose developed Railroad Tycoon in 1990, then another company called Pop Top Software developed the next two in the series, and then after a trip to Minotaur Wonderland in Hamburg, Germany, Meyer decided to do what he essentially already did for Pop Pirates, reinvent a classic game from the early 90s for the mid 2000s. Like Pirates, this game looks dated compared to games today, but you can see how advanced this remake is compared to its humble, uh, rudimentary beginnings. And like Pirates, I did play a little bit of this before, but I played much less and have virtually no memory of what this game is like, so I'm going in essentially completely blind. Not unlike Pirates, this game also starts off with a charming intro movie. I'm not sure if the guy setting out his model train tracks is supposed to like frame the game as actually being toys that this guy is playing with, but it doesn't really matter. The movie is charming, and it sets the tone for the setting we're about to be playing in. So the first thing I check for in these games is the controls, because I know these old games are notorious for having some rudimentary controls, but I must say this and Pirates did pretty well in this regard. Pirates had that weird hotkey setup with a number pad that I never found super useful, and Railroads doesn't let you click and drag the screen like later Sid Meier games would, but overall I was pretty impressed. There was nothing particularly jarring about these old PC game controls. I instinctively pressed the right mouse button to go back in the menus and it worked. I mean, I guess 2006 wasn't like the fucking Stone Age, but the fact that I don't have anything in particular to say about the controls of a game that's over 10 years old is a testament to how well they've held up. So anyway, so like, what do you actually do in Sid Meier's Railroads? That was the question I wanted to answer, and if you've never played the game before like me, the idea you're forming in your head is probably pretty accurate. You just kind of build railroads between cities and trading posts and buy trains to deliver cargo and passengers between them. You win the game by buying out all of your competition, and that leads me into something I was not expecting this game to have, a damn economy simulator, kind of. So I was just doing the tutorial, learning about how to place railroads down and send trains where I want them to, when the tutorial decided to give me two little text windows explaining how stocks work, and then the tutorial was over. So like all of these tabs up here relating to the economy, I just kind of had to figure out for myself. Speaking of the tutorial, this aspect of the game is pretty dated because it's pretty bad. Particularly this one part where I had literally no idea what it was asking me to do or how to do it. So basically, all it evidently wanted me to do was wrap the end of one track around to the track that was parallel to it, but the tutorial implies it will only take two clicks to do this. Now, to my viewers out there who maybe have a keen sense of sight, you might notice it took more than two clicks to do this. It also would have been nice if it had explained what the signal was, because I had no fucking idea as I was playing the game, and I still have no fucking idea as I'm reading the script. Now eventually, as you can see, I figured it out, but you would expect in these tutorials for it to not allow you to do something that isn't what you're supposed to do, right? Usually in a beginner tutorial for a game like this, the game will stop the player's action if they're trying to do something that's not what the game is telling them to do. Oh, but not in this game! I was just kind of placing tracks willy-nilly, hoping in vain that I was progressing towards what the game wanted. Now, fortunately, there is an option to sell the train tracks. Oh, but not in the tutorial! This means that when I trialed and aired my way through the tutorial's objectives and fucked up, I had to restart the whole tutorial to try again, twice! Whew, but once I figured it out and the game decided I was sufficiently educated in the inner workings of the stock market, I was free to start an actual game. I mean, I could have done that from the get-go, the tutorial is not actually required. So yeah, you can adjust the parameters when you start a single player game. There's different scenarios in different parts of the world, including the Firaxis logo, or excuse me, Fiery Axis, clever. You can set the years and the difficulty and the number of opponents. According to the tutorial, you win the game by buying out said opponents, but there's also some smaller goals you can try to achieve along the way, and completing them will do something, probably, if I had to guess. I don't know. 
So, when you actually start a game, at least in this beginner scenario, you begin by two towns that you're kind of guided towards developing with some trains. Now, admittedly, placing down train tracks isn't as fun as placing down, say, roller coaster tracks because you're just trying to be as efficient as possible here and your money runs out quickly. Most of these types of games I've played give you a decent amount of money to start with so you can have a bit of leeway before you really need to start budgeting, but here, you run out of money only after placing a few tracks. Fortunately though, you earn back your money just as quickly. So you get that money by delivering goods to different places. Each city and settlement or industry has different supply and demands and it's your job to get the right items on the right trains and to send them to the right places in the right order. There's a bit of a growing economy when you do this because raw materials can be delivered to a settlement where they'll be converted into a good that can then be delivered elsewhere, like lumber being converted to paper that can then be delivered to a city's newspaper industry. If you have enough money, you can buy the industries that produce the raw materials directly so you can make even more money on deliveries. When you try to purchase an industry, it starts an auction that all the players can participate in. Furthermore, throughout your game, there will be little auctions for the patent rights of new inventions that will give you an edge during the 10 years you control it before it becomes public domain. And these can be bonuses like a 25% delivery bonus for perishables or a damn 25% price decrease on railroads. So that one's pretty useful. I like these little patent auctions that would pop up randomly. They give you something else to spend your money on and you have to find out right then and there if it's worth investing in. But as you can see, the actual railroad building and train management is just a small portion of the economy building simulator that this game features. But I guess that's not all too surprising. In Roller Coaster Tycoon, you do do more in your theme park than just building roller coasters. But in an ironic twist of fate, the railroad building and train management was the one aspect of this game that I was having the most trouble with. Alright, so look, I have this industry space that produces oil, so my idea was to have a train that would just gather as much oil as it could and deliver portions of it to the various places that my railroad connects to that demand oil. But I could not for the life of me figure out how to do that, if I even could. Like look, I can add the maximum of 8 cars to the train, all full of oil and send it off wherever. It'll be slow as fuck, but even if I'm cool with that, it'll always dump all the oil off at the first place it stops at. The little train car buttons seem to be only for supplying the train with cargo, not dropping any off, and I couldn't find a way to say drop off two cars of oil at one stop and replace them with two cars of beef to drop off at the next stop. At least so far as I saw, the trains would just do whatever the fuck they wanted. Even if my plan was really stupid, it doesn't sound like something I shouldn't be able to do, so I wish the menu interface would either clearly let me do what I wanted or more clearly tell me what I was able to do because there is just not much information being conveyed here. So I had the train take the full oil cargo from the energy plant to Bullhead City Depot and I wanted the train to just drop off half of the shipment but I just left everything. I thought this meant that it would only drop off half of the 8 cars but apparently it means it'll drop off all of the 8 cars and then pick up 4 more? Then why did it leave Bullhead with 4 empty cars of oil even though Bullhead clearly has the oil supply since I just dropped off 8 cars worth and when it went to the next stop, Barstow, it just dropped off 2 empty cars and went on its way. All I wanted was for this train to have a routine shipment of delivering oil to everybody but I just couldn't seem to find a way to do that. I'm sure veteran players of this game know what I'm doing wrong and it might just be a case of me still learning the ropes and I still wouldn't put it past me that I'm just really stupid but I think it's telling that I'm still confused as to how to maneuver my trains in a game about trains an hour and a half in. So despite all of that and some of the tomfuckery that I found my trains getting into, by the end of my playthrough I found myself getting into the flow a bit more. There's different cities and settlements just scattered all over the map and as you get more money by moving around resources, you can afford to go settle there and collect their resources and they'll offer incentives for you to deliver resources there which will develop your economy more which will allow you to buy out industries and new train models and stonks from your opponents. On one playthrough I retired early during, I was rewarded with the rank of hobo but by the time I ended my my final longest playthrough, I'd achieved the rank of Riverboat Gambler, so I was making progress. So even if I didn't fully grasp how to tell my trains to do exactly what I wanted, by the time I'd finished up, I was having fun and continuing still to get the hang of everything. Now out of this and Pirates, Pirates comes up ahead for me, but they're apples and oranges in terms of games and I can tell there's a lot to be had out of railroads if that's your cup of tea, I just think it could've explained things better for those who might not commonly drink tea. Alright, so we're going from the sea, to the ground, to the air with our last set of games. A pair of twins, really. Sid Meier's Ace Patrol and Sid Meier's Ace Patrol Pacific Skies. So these are the most recent games I've talked about with both coming out in 2013, and they're also the only ones to not have their own Wikipedia page, which makes me wonder if that could be a testament to their unremarkableness. 
All Wikipedia does say is that Ace Patrol is a World War I flight strategy game and Ace Patrol Pacific Skies is a World War II flight strategy game. I also have absolutely zero game time on either of these, never even got around to trying them, so I'm actually going into these as blind as could ever possibly fucking be. Figured I'd go in order and start with the war to end all wars before going on to the second war. So this game, Sid Meier's Ace Patrol, is... it's something. It's definitely not pretty. I'd almost believe this was the oldest game I've talked about, not the most recent. This game came out in 2013. 2013! But if it's right alongside the graphics of the other two games I've talked about, one from 2004 and the other 2006, the planes themselves adopt this kind of comic book look to them, which looks alright, but they're the only thing to adopt this look. The rest of the environment adopts the look of shit. When you swoop over the landscape, you can see the compressed image forming the ground, and you can see that there's not actually any depth or height to these mountains or canyons. And whenever a plane explodes, it just looks fucking dreadful. Not every game is required to strive for amazing graphics, but you'd expect a game bearing Sid Meier's name would look better than this, especially in 2013. So, like, what do you do in Sid Meier's Ace Patrol? Well, it's a turn-based tactics kind of game where you move on a hex board to try and effectively outmaneuver your opponents to accomplish some sort of goal, usually shooting down all of the enemies or defending some sort of beacon on the map. So as you fly around and position your plane, you'll only be able to move to other specific positions from any one specific position. So you have to maneuver yourself effectively to get to where you need to go. And as the game progresses, you'll unlock newer movement options like rolls and loops that allow you a wider variety of battlefield movement tactics. So, I mean, on paper, all of that sounds well and good, but when you get to playing the game, it's just so slow. Most of the missions I did just evolved into a game of cat and mouse where I'm either chasing or getting chased and both times I just have to meticulously fly myself around to get in the line of sight of the opponent's plane which often just felt like it was taking forever. I just got bored pretty often when I was in a pretty empty sky slowly positioning my plane where I wanted to go. Now at the very least, at least I had some nice music to listen to while I did this. Oh no wait, no, I'm, I'm sorry, there is fucking no music. Just the lovely sound of propellers starting and stopping constantly. Alright, so any of the blue arrows simply move you to that position, but the green ones will move you whilst shooting enemies. And I know you're supposed to strategically position yourself so you can be in the most advantageous spot, but anytime I had the opportunity to just shoot another plane, I just went for whichever arrow did the most damage. And that worked for me because I found this game to be really easy. Granted, I was doing early game stuff and I was unintentionally playing on rookie, but even once I changed to pilot, the highest damage number tactic just worked. And even when two of my pilots crashed on the last mission I completed, they were just released from their POW camps at Christmas time. Like immediately after they crashed, like the next day. One other thing I just want to bitch about is right when you start the game. I did the full game with the training missions and right when you start it tells you to pick your nation and tells you what the bonuses they get are. But I haven't played the game yet so I don't know what the fuck any of this means. The British nation can perform one extra high G maneuver? The fuck is a high G maneuver? Am I going to be doing those often? Is it advantageous for me to do one more of them? Does that make it worth picking Britain? What the fuck should I know? I ended up picking America because I figured I'd be fucking up a lot so it'd be useful for my pilots to recover from their injuries faster. And then you pick a squadron leader and I mean I don't fucking know how useful it is to avoid flak damage or what plane upgrades this guy would be copying. Again I figured I'd be fucking up so I gave myself the chick who's fast at repairing planes. I just hate when games make you start off by picking options for the game ahead of time without telling you what those options will actually entail. So that's as far as I got through Ace Patrols. I mean, there's more stuff like new planes to unlock and new shit you can add to them or your pilots, but I mean, you saw the gameplay. I just got too bored to care. I wasn't too excited by Ace Patrols, but surprisingly, I could see it being at least a little amusing with a friend, turning the boring cat and mouse gameplay into a frantic one with y'all both chasing each other. Alright, so moving on to the war, after the war to end all wars, we have Ace Patrol's Pacific Skies, and this is pretty much a carbon copy of the first game. Instead of choosing four nations to fight in World War I, you can either pick the navy or the army of either Japan or America in World War II. And also there's no unique bonus for whichever nation you choose, either that or the game didn't feel like telling you what they are this time around. You might think that picking the navy would give you maybe some variety with ship combat, given that that's what the navy tends to be known for, but the only difference I found is that you're bases on an aircraft carrier this time around instead of on land, whatever difference that makes. 
that might not be fair to say there might be a bigger difference between the army and the navy i just didn't progress that far to find out once i saw that this game was pretty much a reskin of the first game i just really didn't care to continue playing the only noteworthy things i wrote down were that the intro screen was kind of cool how it swapped between american and japanese music And also, when I started a new game without the intro missions, I was given experimental technology for my plane due to my outstanding performance on my last mission, despite not having completed a single mission yet. So as I was playing this game, I had a suspicion in the back of my mind that I looked into once I was done that turned out to be correct. These games began their lives as mobile games. That made a lot more sense given their simplicity and poor graphics. As mobile games, I could see them being more enjoyable. They're basically board games where you unlock new ways to move your pieces throughout the game and I could see them being more fun on a bus or something, but the repetitive gameplay bored the hell out of me sitting in front of a computer monitor. I just kept thinking of the opportunity cost of playing this game. The other better games I could be spending my time playing instead of this, but I'm not because I'm spending my time playing this. So I guess it wasn't fair to compare the graphics of this game to the console games released in 2013, but even when compared to the other mobile games released in 2013, these graphics look bad. This was the same year Infinity Blade 3 came out, and that game still looks pretty decent blown up on a big computer monitor. And I'm not even playing the mobile version, I'm playing the PC port of the mobile version, which you would think they would attempt to make look even nicer, and maybe they did, but if that's the case, then they did a shit job of it because those ground textures look fucking atrocious. And there's still no music during the goddamn missions. Would they just decide that music was too much of an expense for a game? As mobile games, I could see these games having enjoyment within them, but as PC games, I found the gameplay too boring to care to continue playing. And that's a point I really want to get across. I barely scratched the surface on four games that would collectively take at least 40 hours to complete. So take all of my thoughts on them with a grain of salt. They're not meant to be definitives, just a humorous first impressions. If any of these games looked interesting to you, despite some of my annoyances, I recommend you check them out. They're all a bit older, so therefore a bit cheaper, and there's definitely still enjoyment to be had in all of them. So if I had to rank each of these games, I'd honestly do it in the order I just happen to review them here. Pirates is the only one that I really could see myself going back to because I really was getting into the rhythm of it and having a good time. To a lesser extent, Railroads as well, but my grasp on its mechanics are still a little too weak for me to want to continue playing it, and I just don't really have an interest to learn the rest of it. Sid Meier's name is most known for being part of a decently complicated strategy game, but as you can see, these types of strategy games are his bread and butter because he's been developing them for decades. I only played a fraction of the games he's had a hand in making, and overall I give them a thumbs up. The Ace Patrol games are the last games with Sid Meier's name that isn't part of the Civilization franchise, as well as the last non-Civilization games Paraxis has developed aside from XCOM 2. Even though I wasn't there for them, I missed the days when Sid Meier's name would be on games that were just named after a thing. A game about pirates or railroads or Gettysburg or golf. The Civilization games are really good, but I wish they weren't the only thing that Sid Meier and Firaxis have decided to devote their time towards. Gamers tend to want games to be taken seriously like movies, but I'd wager that the casual moviegoer can name more movie directors than the casual gamer could name game directors. So I like how there exists at least one game director whose name most gamers are familiar with. And as for that game director's games, well, they're good, if not a little outdated now. Which is why I wish Firaxis would take a chance on some new unique titles that have the opportunity to leave a similar impact to the old unique titles. Alright, so if you made it this far, thanks for sticking through with me to the end. It was definitely a long and arduous, but also really fun process to get here, and hopefully you enjoyed it. If you have any kind of feedback regarding the quality of the video, my presentation style, or any other ideas for any other future videos, I would definitely love to hear those and take them into account. And also, of course, if you feel so inclined as to like, comment, maybe even subscribe, you know, not only does it help the all-seeing algorithm that everybody loves to talk about, but also gives me motivation to do more of these and lets me know what I could do better. So again, thanks for watching, especially if you got this far, and uh, have a good one. I'll have more of these for you in the future.